Okay. Welcome everybody to the sixth session of our post-conference, our ICA 2020 post-conference, Digital Platform Regulation Beyond Transparency and Openness. I'm Fiona Martin from the University of Sydney and I'm co-hosting this conference with Terry Flew, Nick Souza and Rosalie Gallette from the Queensland University of Technology. And in this session, I'm joined by Nicholas Cara from the University of Queensland, James Meese, newly at the Royal Melbourne Institute of Technology, uh, Wan Bo Chu, my co colleague from uh, the University of Sydney, and Chun Mezi Su from the Queensland University of Technology. Thanks for joining us today. It's great to see you. Um, this is a new experience for all of us. Um, what I'm going to do is hand over now to Nicholas. Nicholas is going to kick off today with his presentation. So Nick, um, looking forward to what you've got to say. We'll take questions in between each of the presentations. Thanks. Thanks, Diana. Third time lucky. <laughs> um, so this, uh, my presentation today is about uh, the relationship between alcohol marketers and digital platforms. Uh, and to me, um, I, I'm kind of interested in this story partly because what we see alcohol marketers doing on platforms over the past decade is a kind of microcosm for a whole range of different regulatory issues. Uh, but also alcohol marketers were early movers and innovators on platforms. Today so there was a full ad model, uh, figuring out how to use the platform at first, figuring out how to use kind of participatory cultures to their advantage, but then also bit by bit, helping platforms kind of refine their, their data-driven advertising model. Uh, so what we kind of see, we, we often think that platforms kind of invented their ad model and sold it out to the market. But in a lot of ways, we're there imagining how they might use platforms long before there was an ad, helping platforms figure out how to build the ad model. Uh, and we see this with alcohol marketers in all sorts of ways, but perhaps uh, this kind of um, is a bit of a watershed moment where uh, Fago, Diageo being one of the largest alcohol distributors in the world, announced this quite formal partnership in 2012, uh, which was effectively one of the first uh, kind of consultancy type arrangements between Facebook and advertisers, in this case a major alcohol distributor, uh, where there'd be kind of Facebook consultants embedded within Diageo and vice versa to enter into kind of uh, data-driven experiments where, where Diageo would provide data to Facebook and vice versa in order to try to develop more sophisticated approaches to targeting and kind of leveraging the participatory culture of the platform. Uh, these, these exchanges and early consultancies were really important because of the way they went on to inform the growing development of tools like Facebook's custom audiences and lookalike audiences. Uh, the, the announcement is kind of telling to me because, uh, you know, eight years on, we really don't see platforms and major poll distributors making these kinds of feverish, excited public statements about their partnerships anymore. Uh, this partnership caused a lot of controversy and both Facebook and the alcohol industry that the public wouldn't respond to this stuff by going, wow, that's amazing. What a new, you know, what an incredible kind of new form of marketing. Instead, it, it caused controversy because it spoke to some of the, um, the, the very data-driven and hard potential forms of marketing that were being developed here. So these, these partnerships now are effectively completely dark. We don't really think about them. Uh, but secondly, really importantly, we were, we were starting to see here the emergence of relationships between the alcohol industry and forms. So it weren't just about buying and selling, advertising. They were much deeper consultancy type arrangements. Uh, with personnel, expertise, and really importantly, data was sh being shared back and forth between marketers and platforms. Uh, and, and as kind of indicated a moment ago, these, these kind of informed the development of things, um, of tools that have now become kind of baked into Facebook's larger model, like custom audience, the look like audience, um, uh, emerging tools like Make Creative. Um, Custom audiences are a tool where, a custom and lookalike audiences are a tool where marketers divide their own data sets, uploading their own data set into Facebook's ad model. And Facebook then simulates or generates new audiences based on the, on the data that, that marketers provide. So the lookalike audience is kind of simulated audience that Facebook builds based on what a marketer can tell them about their already existing audience. 
Uh, these forms of uh, audience building tools are uniquely hard to give commodities like alcohol because the algorithmic architecture of the platform easily learns unintended proxies for excessive or dependent drinking. So often we'll classify, in a sense, automatically classify dependent drinkers as having a high affinity with all sorts of alcohol consumption uh, and it makes them really transferable. Um, in Facebook, things like their, you know, proximity to licensed venues or purchase history through delivery services and so on. Uh, so with alcohol marketing, the, the development of these kinds of tools um, presents all sorts of public health um, issues that we need to think about. And in a sense, in a larger, um, in, in terms of the larger story about platform regulation, it reminds us that we need to think about much more than moderating, moderating expression on platforms that we really need to think about how the ad model operates and the forms of harms it generates. And, and what we've seen in the alcohol industry and, and the platforms, they've quite happily tried to push the regulatory debate toward questions about moderating content. Uh, and in fact, marketers on these platforms are really good at moderating content, ensuring that so-called offensive content doesn't appear on their brand pages. And Facebook has become better at offering marketers open of tools in a way, all of the activity there in the moderation space acts as a kind of smoke screen uh, for the development of these much more um, harmful forms of, of, the, of the ad model that effectively continue to, 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 um, to, to sort of uh, float beneath the surface. Uh, so today I kind of want to do this quite, um, a quite rapid fire, I suppose, um, story about alcohol marketers and the platforms. There's a kind of series of moments, and I want to kind of track here maturing of an ad model over the last 10, 15 years. And I'm going to do it by kind of talking about five moments. And of course, in the limited time we have, I'm just going to kind of check in really quickly with them. Uh, so let me dive straight in. The organic age is really the period before, an, uh, before a formal ad model when platforms are simply going, uh, sorry, marketers are simply going onto platforms and they're trying to um, uh, generate free reach, free engagement with consumers. And so they were using platforms to figure out what consumers' drinking cultures looked like and then trying to make themselves part of those drinking cultures. So here on stage, we uh, on stage here on screen we have an example of the Australian rum brand Bundaberg Rum, uh, kind of trying to emulate uh, chatter on Facebook about so-called 5 p.m. knockoff on Friday afternoon, where the Bundy Bear basically kind of banging for a rum anytime after midday, uh, and acting like he was a kind of tradie on a building side and wait to knock off and have a rum. Uh, we also see brands in this period really encouraging consumers to say things that the brand itself could never say under its own self-regulatory code. So the brand would post something that looked fairly benign. Here we have Jim B saying our soup of the day is bourbon. Uh, but clearly what the post is trying to do is stimulate consumers to say things that fall way outside the self-regulatory codes of the industry. So we have uh, some examples there on the screen of uh, comments. This particular post uh, really aggressively celebrating excessive consumption. Uh, as I said a moment ago, we don't see this anymore. Brands have learned to moderate this content off their public pages um, and, and shift it, if you like, below the line into ephemeral or influencer content. Uh, the organic age gives way to what we think of as kind of the affinity age. And so this is the moment where platforms start to intervene in an algorithmic sense. Uh, and and say to brands, our game is to generate ignorant platforms. And if you flood our platforms with marketing content, that harms all of our interests. Consumers will log off the platform. Uh, so brands uh, start to get promoted or punished by the algorithm, depending on the kinds of generation that, sorry, the kinds of engagement they are able to generate. And so in this period, we see brands trying to make themselves or trying to generate meaningful or so-called authentic engagements with consumers that would play well within the kind of affinity weighted algorithms of platforms like Facebook and then Instagram. Uh, and so examples of kind of tactics that begin to emerge here is brands move much more deliberately out into the real world, uh, getting consumers to use their smartphones to generate user generated content, to tag the brand, like the brand. Um, a lot of hinges here on alcohol brands, getting consumers to engage with them in order for the brand to be rated favor weighted favorably uh, in content recommendation algorithms on the platforms. Uh, 
So this example on screen is a Strongbow Slider uh, building a really elaborate themed activation at a festival. Uh, and the purpose of the activation, of course, is to get people to photograph themselves partying on the boat and so on. And again, here also sharing content that the brand itself could never share, underage consumers, uh, excessive forms of consumption and so on. Uh, another really important strategy in this period was the rise of a particular kind of promotional labor, the laborer, the promoter or nightlife photographer. And their job was effectively to go out and photograph drinking culture and post images of it to brand websites. Uh, so again, generating this kind of affinity or connections between cultural events, consumers and the brand. And also here, begin to assemble much more detailed sets of data, data that linked together alcohol brands, consumers, their social networks, particular cultural events and so on. You can see in the comments on screen by this particular promoter that promoters were learning the logic of the affinity driven algorithms of the platform. So this photographer was like many of them explaining to me uh, that they quite deliberately only photographed hot people and particularly um, hot, hot girls as they would put it because they got more likes, more engagement on the platform, which meant more engagement for the brand. Okay, move out of this kind of, if the organic and affinity areas are really where brands are generating unpaid reach, then, then in the last five years, platforms have learnt to make brands pay. And so brands now uh, can't generate much free organic reach on platforms. They need to pay for every bit of reach that they want. And so what brands are learning to do is work with influencers and use the kind of sponsored promotional um, uh, tools on platforms. Uh, and, and as part of that also shift more and more of their content into ephemeral and below the line um, uh, techniques. Uh, what, this, uh, what the upshot of this is, is that alcohol marketing becomes much less um, visible. It's, it becomes much more impervious to public forms of scrutiny. Uh, in the example on screen here, we have an, ad, uh, a, an influencer campaign. that's only really disclosed in fairly subtle ways by using the brand hashtag. Uh, and was actually kind of feel like found out by the regulator for featuring uh, consumers who are underage. Underage, he means under 25. Alcohol brands agree that they won't depict anyone under 25 in their marketing. Uh, but here they were using influencers at the age of 25. Uh, and, and also we're seeing that brands are starting to move into, when I say ephemeral content, I'm thinking forms like Instagram stories, where I content are really only visible for a short period of time before they disappear and are only visible to the particular consumers that brands have chosen to target. So the story here is uh, one where the participatory aspects of the model uh, of the advertising model of the platforms becomes much more optimized uh, because brands can exert greater control of it using the, the, the data-driven tools within platform, uh, but also they're much less um, experimental because they're having to pay. So they're, they're working out um, over and over again uh, what kinds of action on the platform generate the sorts of engagement that are worth paying for. So we, we have here emerging a kind of settlement between the alcohol marketers and the platforms uh, where the platforms offer marketers much more fine-brained, much more targeted, much more different forms of advertising. Uh, but the flip side of that is that the marketers then have to engage with the platform's formal model. So in the, um, to kind of skip ahead a little bit, uh, what we've seen then emerge in the last few years is, is a bit of an accountability war. Now, this, is, this has come because of the, um, the controversy uh, in some respects around the 2016 presidential election, but it's had spillover effects. We've seen the launch of things like the Facebook ad library, which begins to give us a sense of um, the scale of below the line alcohol marketing on these platforms. And to just show one example, this was from yesterday, looking at Jimmy Brings, an alcohol home delivery service in Australia. Uh, lots of home delivery services are lot, doing lots of COVID related marketing at the moment. Uh, here on Jimmy Brings this week, they're running about 150 versions of a COVID themed ad. Uh, and these ads are being produced using a dynamic creative tool. So effectively the marketer uploads all sorts of different content into the platform. And Facebook's machine learning model tests out different variations of the content for different consumers to figure out what will get the, the required levels of engagement. Um, these forms of these forms of, of accountability in, we can't access the platform API. We can only really look and monitor in real time in a fairly superficial sense what marketers are doing. So kind of, um, uh, I realize I've got a couple of minutes left, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna skip this uh, next part, but just to say, to point to some other ways and some other work that 
machine vision, particularly identifying alcohol containers and logos with their images is kind of also an emerging aspect of the relationship between drink culture marketers and platforms. Um, what we've seen over the last decade then is a kind of formalization of the advertising model on platforms where marketers uh, have worked very closely with platforms to establish much more formal relationships and much more formal um, modes of buying advertising. But platforms and advertisers are remaining tactically focused on moderated content uh, and providing some transparency of their activities. Um, uh, they're focused on developing rules and guidelines of the platform, some basic transparency tools, and these really enable us to kind of avoid larger questions. Uh, and particularly, um, um, uh, kind of activities of market platforms here uh, are keeping us away from thinking about the emergence of a form of advertising that's really no longer about the ads. Like we think of that Jimmy Brings example, there is an a particular ad here. There's a series of data-driven operations they look like audiences are being being built and served by increasingly dynamic forms of uh, content. Uh, and so here, as we kind of as the ad model formalizes the relationship between the text and the target collapses, and we need to begin to think of this form of advertising as a series of data and operations. Uh, as a first step to insist, I think, on the publicness of marketing, that our marketing affects the quality of public life and therefore must be available. Uh, to public scrutiny and we also need to focus on harms so we need to think about the ways in which users are given meaningful understand uh, access to how they're being marketed and options to opt out and at the platform level we need to think about the transparency of targeting approaches and the tools being used um, so that they can be opened up to proper forms of public scrutiny i think i've hit my 15 minutes fiona is that right Yes, it is. Yep, you have hit yeah, so your. I, so I think I think I will pause my presentation there. Thank you. Thanks so much, Nick. Um, now, does anyone have any questions out of that? Because um, I'm sure that you would. I certainly do. I've got a question about opting out. Like in those sort of um, uh, those last examples you gave us where there's a kind of mix and match of messages, images and targeting, um, how do you opt out? I guess what I'm thinking about there is in a very rudimentary sense, Facebook enables you to go in and view your Facebook ad preferences and then remove certain preferences. So I can go into my ad, ad preferences and see um, that say alcohol is a preference and I can say I can turn that preference off. But if I go back in a couple of months later, Facebook will have reassigned me that preference. Um, and also, so that's one part of the problem. The other part mm. of the problem is that marketers will work on proxies. So, so I might turn off alcohol, but there might be all sorts of other preferences that marketers and, and maybe not even a marketer in the human sense, but the lookalike audience model has found other sorts of proxies for alcohol consumption. And so that option to turn off preferences needs to be kind of beefed up so that a consumer, you know, like um, in Australia, we have, we have anecdotal examples of dependent drinkers, um, you know, finding that, that, that home delivery services, ch ch service, services ch chase them all over, their, all over their platform, you know? Um, so every time they're in Facebook, they're getting pushed ads for home delivery alcohol. And they, they, their only choice at the moment is simply to delete Facebook. Um, mm. uh, but there should be a way in which people can choose just simply to never see certain kinds of content uh, because it does them harm. Fair enough. Anyone else got any questions? James? Yeah, yeah. just jumping off that, really, I was just wondering if obviously there's been some debate in the uh, public health area, but I was wondering if things like Alcoholics Anonymous or other recovery services uh, were working towards developing best practices or was there any engagement between the recovery community and um, these more formal structures? Yeah, it's a good question, James, in the sense that um, there traditionally hasn't been much interaction between people who are looking for reform of alcohol advertising. Yeah, you know, there's been a kind of difference between uh, people who are focused on what would be considered a prevention sort of interventions in public health versus the kind of treatment interventions. Um, and, and I think what's been interesting in the last couple of years is more and more treatment services reaching out and saying, we are finding one of the challenges of treatment now is that people are immersed in this kind of flows of digital content, 
which makes it very difficult for them to avoid, um, you know, uh, for, I guess, um, triggers or stimulus to alcohol consumption. Uh, and so there, there is that kind of recognition that this is a, is a sort of a treatment issue in ways that hasn't been in the past. Um, uh, so, but, but, uh, but uh, yeah, I'm not, I've not seen treatment services in a sense uh, argue for best practice around marketing, but are certainly starting to say more about the harms of marketing. Um, yeah, but, but not in a super developed way just yet. Oh, you're on mute. You're on mute, Fiona. Yeah, one of the great things about this, you're on mute, people. Um, <laughs> Wombo or Maisie, did you have questions? No, I don't think so. Actually, no. I'm not familiar with the topic. You know? Me either. I'm not familiar with the alcohol and <laughs> yeah. stuff and legislations because. One of the things that, that amazes me is the difficulty of studying this stuff, like actually finding out what is happening in individuals' accounts and then across um, friendship groups, because it, it's quite difficult, as you mentioned towards the end, and actually finding out the diverse, not only the diversity, but the different styles of approach to different people. There's kind of two sides to that too. Like one side of it is that the marketing model itself, partly because marketers want this, has been becoming much more ephemeral and much more dark. Like it's quite deliberately that the, deliberate the advertising is increasingly only visible to the individuals targeted with it um, because it basically turns off the public scrutiny altogether. Mm. But I think it goes hand in hand with our social media cultures changing. So you know, 10 years ago, even eight, seven, eight years ago, it was pretty common for people to be on the Jim Beam Facebook page, you know, away on Jim Beam posts or Forex posts or whatever. Like, um, but now we wouldn't, now you just don't see that. People, people are much more kind of connected in the ways in which they share media network. And so you see more like we're, you know, we, we'll, we'll scram story with a close network, but we won't kind of, Oh, I think we've lost you there, there, Nick. We might move on. Um, James. Public brand page. <laughs> oh. Nick, you trailed off completely there, mate. I'm going to have to, we're going to have to move on. Um, thanks so much for that. That was really fascinating. Um, we can come back to questions if we have time at the end. Um, you might want to check too, Nick, if there's anyone else using bandwidth at your house, because that will certainly um, affect the... Yeah. I found when my daughter was going to school that the bandwidth would just disappear when she was online. Um, okay, I'm sorry, I've got to... No. Cool. Yeah. No worries. Don't worry about it, mate. We were all struggling with that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Okay, if you want to unshare your screen, that's fantastic. James. Mm -hmm. Yeah, cool. Looking forward to yours. Can you guys all see that? Yes, we can. Sweet, okay. Um, yeah, so today I'm going to talk about uh, a kind of project I've been running um, from an ARC grant, which is really looking at how, um, you know, it's kind of a common concern, but really how um, the news media industry has engaged with uh, platforms and algorithms particularly around the area of news distribution. So, um, oh. what I've been, yeah, looking for today is I'll be presenting some findings and we've finished the first phase of research, which is doing some interviews and field work. Um, we started to do some social media data analysis, but um, because of COVID, uh, that analysis kind of got delayed so um, it's very tentative. There'll be lots of hand waving. And then just discussing some emergent arguments from these findings. Uh, so the first phase was interviews and um, we discussed uh, these issues with a bunch of news media professionals from across the sector. We tried to aim at people kind of involved in central areas of distribution. So looking at editors, section editors of verticals, audience editors or social media editors. Um, we got about 15 on the record and 
a number off the record, which helped us kind of contextualize that. Um, and then I attended a bunch of local um, industry conferences and national industry conferences and also seminars like marketing seminars on news and so on. I was looking forward to international conferences in Italy in 2021. That might not be happening, but I'll try and do some international field work um, somehow. So the, the results I'm presenting are coming out from a forthcoming paper in New Media and Society, um, which I've written with Eddie Herkham from QT, looking at this idea of platform dependency and what we um, spoke to our professionals about about the extent to which they felt dependent on, well, I was interested in social media, but obviously it turned out that they were mainly speaking about Facebook. We also interviewed them in an interesting time. It was at the start of 2019. So it was at the start of that kind of post Facebook algorithm change and every um, news company started to lay off staff about a year after that, particularly digital entities. Um, so to a certain extent, we got some data um, from certain certain people who said, um, you know, look, a lot of the news media went into social media relatively naively. Um, one executive kind of said it was great to be able to reach millions of people. We just threw everything on there. And I think post Facebook algorithm change in January 2018, there was a bit of regret going through the news media, at least when I was speaking to them about a year ago. Um, and speaking to a few people from um, social news, so um, sites like uh, BuzzFeed and Australian equivalents to Mike, et cetera, um, there was a real clear evidence there that these companies were following the algorithm and doing weekly pivots, late night arguments on Slack channels about what Facebook was doing that week. But I think what was interesting for us at least was that not every company was as dependent on Facebook as as they made out publicly or even as we expected. Um, so pulling out two sites from uh, the ABC, our public service media organisation, and 9MSN, these are two companies which have a long digital history and, um, you know, have been kind of the standard homepage for many Australians since the mid to late 90s. And what was really fascinating um, speaking to some people from those organisations is the extent to which the homepage was still the key driver of traffic. So we were getting some different narratives. We'd speak to people on social news and they'd say, oh, the homepage is dead. But for other um, companies, you know, the homepage was doing quite well, actually. And um, they weren't necessarily dependent on Facebook for a large amount of traffic. Um, what was great about the newsfeed overhaul was that we also got a sense um, that companies were a bit more strategic about Facebook and regretting that early engagement and starting to diversify the distribution. <clears throat> so th this didn't mean that Facebook wasn't important, but it meant that it wasn't the sole goal or the sole target as it may have been, you know, three, four years ago. Um, there was greater investment in native advertising um, obviously, licensing and that's a merge of the news tab and the Australian Code of Conduct was something they were already prepping for. Um, returning to SEO and even engaging in some long tail social, so looking at Pinterest, LinkedIn, and so on. Um, so, I guess coming from this, um, our paper tries to bring some sort of nuance to the platform dependency model. So, you know, we're kind of seeing that not all companies are equally dependent on social traffic, at least in these kind of early findings. Um, obviously publishers are still publishing on news, on social. Um, social does affect how news is presented on social media. There's a turn to effective content, but we're sort of situating this between part of a broader distribution strategy. I guess the only qualification to that is the emergent risks from new forms of platformization, such as Apple News. Um, yeah, so to kind of just provide some final thoughts and summaries. Um, yeah, we're not seeing serious dependency except for these newer socially oriented sites. Um, you know, the obvious question from Australia is should platforms pay? Um, there's a question about whether they're actually essential as opposed to, you know, one of many intermediaries for traffic in Australia. And the Reuters report from 2019 says that, you know, Australia, Canada, US, we actually have quite a mixed diversity of how people come to find news. Um, the other um, thing to do with COVID-19 
is we also just see the fact that that despite all of these different plays, news media has just got an ongoing dependency on advertising that it hasn't really grappled with, despite the fact of being 20 years um, or, or more since the emergence of kind of, you know, online news sites. So that dependency of advertising precedes platforms and has continued on through platforms. And, and obviously the um, COVID also revealed ongoing risks to news around this advertising dependency through algorithmic defunding. So, you know, um, coronavirus being placed on block lists and advertisers pulling funding from news sites accordingly. So even if news leaves or, you know, departs from social media platforms, they're going to still struggle with these algorithmic um, systems as long as they rely on search. But I think more critically on an advertising based business model. Um, there are definitely strong um, public interest arguments though to regulate platforms as privacy harms, opaque algorithms, you know, they perform a gatekeeper role as um, Phil Napoli has pointed out. But I think what we're seeing particularly in Australia is there's a risk where um, the mandatory code potentially provides news organisations. We're seeing the ACCC talk about potentially giving preemptive notice of algorithmic changes to news companies. Um, they may yet be getting more transparency than the public. So while news media and journalism may be downstream beneficiaries of reform. It kind of shows the risks involved when they're the primary vector through which reform is pursued rather than the public or, or the public interest. Uh, as a final note, um, this question of payments that have emerged from the um, AFC um, and the code of conduct has a risk to potentially um, lock in existing players and potentially assist um, a concentrated media environment in Australia rather than um, assist plurality. And one interesting thing coming from that, um, I guess, social media moment is the extent of new um, media businesses that emerged from that, that social media boost. And many we spoke to said they managed to ride the wave and build something of a business off the back of that increased visibility provided to the algorithm. So I'll leave it there, but I'm happy to obviously talk more in this session or even on email about these methods or, or any of these findings. Fantastic. Thank you so much, James. Um, I'm interested um, particularly in the idea of algorithmic defunding and how it's become um, an issue for the news media. You talked about COVID. Are there other topics that tend to like, uh, simply because of the focus on bad news, other topics that tend to um, I think there's, um, cause I, defunding? There's a general um, sense with um, news media that there's kind of an, um, they're, they're kind of caught between Google and Facebook. They want to, obviously, as Nick's kind of pointed out, they want to provide advertisers with a good experience. And um, the risk for news is the extent to which um, these these ads are placed against yeah ag against like negative topics. I think what how it plays out is um, ad ad cost decline right, which affects in um, funding for news, which might not have as much of a problem on a day to day news um, beat, but the entire um, obviously the last two or three months has been COVID 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 and all news can talk about is COVID. Um, that sustained decline in funding is um, something that has a material impact. And when twinned with obviously advertisers not, not advertising for other macroeconomic reasons, um, that's, the, um, that's the kind of critical thing that I think has um, caused, you know, news companies to, to pay more attention to something that they always knew was there, but has just been exposed as a, a yet another risk factor to the funding of news. Yeah. Anyone else have questions? Nick or Wanda, Maisie? Yeah. Yeah. Nick, yeah? Nick, yeah, okay, sorry. Um, the I, I guess I just wanted to ask a little bit more, James, about um, the, some of the different, like you, you might, I, like the really in interesting observation about the businesses that were still finding the homepage um, was a big source of traffic and that in a sense then the homepage meant that they were less exposed 
to the platform, if I understood you right. Yeah? Yeah. Um, and so I just wanted to ask a little bit more about the difference between um, the, the, the born social news organizations who, you know, like Junkie and BuzzFeed and so on, that, that are kind of, you know, they, they emerge into the social media economy, but they're also then totally dependent on the platform in some respects versus the, the kind of, um, you know, older or more traditional news businesses that were native to social, but also just had other, you know, um, were also less dependent on it. Um, what, do you find that those born social businesses are way more to algorithmic changes um, or, or is it not quite how? I, I missed what you said, but did you say that if those businesses are way more into algorithmic changes or way more dependent on? No, no I said um, born social news service, Chucky, they are just are way more exposed to, you know, financially vulnerable, if you like, uh, uh, because of their dependence on platforms. Um, I think what you find is an interesting love-hate relationship for those sites. In terms of financial exposure, like Junk is a really good example of a company that's, um, you know, the, the, the one thing to say with these born social sites is they didn't have legacy costs. So as we saw in the 20, early 2010s, um, legacy media, you know, they were these large, you know, large companies that had to shrink rapidly into a context of declining costs. The benefit of something like Junkie is they've been able to scale accordingly and not necessarily rapidly um, with the in line with the platform. They've also diversified. And I think, um, you know, you could speak to someone like um, Tim Dwyer, the editor about this, he'd say their reliance on things like native advertising have limited their exposure to platform variants. But the final thing is just that these companies are maybe more accepting of what Facebook is and Google. And in their minds, they've done a deal with the devil and they know they've done it. It's, they have literally built, built their company off the back of it. They're, they're willing to give Facebook and Google credit for saying we wouldn't be here without them. But I suppose they've also got the organisational flexibility to respond appropriately. Right. Yeah, that's really interesting. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Matt. No One more. You want to ask a question? Yes, actually, I think, so in my opinion, one reason behind this algorithm defunding is because of those funding of the news mostly come from advertisement. But during the coronavirus out outbreak, so personally, I can see the increasing demand for those credible news. So I subs subscribe to some news and pay the money because many credible news sources require subscri subscription fee to read the full articles. Otherwise, they only offer the free abstract in those, on those social media. So do you think making the subscriptions as the main re revenue sources and the improvement of the quality of these news will be help helpful in this situation? I mean, I think the struggle is, and, and you know, Victor Picard and others would, would, would probably um, point to this, is that subscription revenue can't ever replace the full amount of revenue that was coming from things like advertising or the full amount of revenue that was coming from, you know, other, other business strategies. But I think, and, and seeing from the discussion in industry around 2010, there was a greater focus on subscription retention and basically treating news like you would any other product, like a marketing funnel where you interest the consumer, you, you try and, you know, using the Nick's tactics, you try and follow that consumer and entice them to subscribe again. And and it's quite interesting in a way that, um, you know, one comment was they were really delineating between forms of traffic, that a few years ago, social traffic was seen as something valuable. And now it's nowhere near as valuable as someone that keeps coming direct to the homepage because that's someone who's interested in the brand and may be able to be retained as a subscriber. So at least in the Australian context, we're seeing, of, and even in those traffic patterns I was pointing out, we're seeing, I think, a real return to subscription. Whether that's enough, I, I, I don't think so, personally. Mm. But it's a good start for a cost-based. James, that was a terrific presentation. I have lots more questions about 
the value of building audience online around social and stuff like that. But I'll leave that for the comments that after we put this up, after we put this video up, the videos will be up for a couple of weeks and people will be able to comment. So right. save it for them. We'll move now to Wumbo. And um, whenever you're ready, you can share your screen with us. In my screen? Yep. That's great. Okay, my name is Yuan Bo, and today my topic is rethinking the regulatory policies on live streaming platforms. And I've done a comparison between the regulations on Twitch and Douyu. About the significance of this study, we can see the cases in recent years. In 2017, a man in Thailand broadcast killing his daughter before suicide, and the video has been circulated around the internet for 24 hours and viewed by more than, viewed more than 300,000 times. No one can charge against Facebook because Facebook was following according to the protocol in 2017. And in 2018, Lu Benwei, Lu Benwei is a Chinese top streamer, and he instigated his fans to against others because some people report him cheating during the gaming. So he instigated those fans and created fierce conflicts both online and offline between different groups of people. In 2019, we can also see the Christchurch massacre Yes, many of you are familiar with this event. So these cases are showing the incapability of existing policies and the regulations. So my research are going to ask what are the characteristics of the live streaming content in terms of the regulation? And what are the current issues of regulation on live streaming and how can different platforms and the regulatory systems learn from each other? I'm comparing Twitch and Douyu and relate them to a broader social, economic and political conditions suggesting new regulatory strategies specifically for the live stream platforms and the data collected from the in-depth interview and second-hand resources. Firstly, let's take a look at characteristics of live streaming content in terms of regulation. Martini points out that live streaming enable a high intensity user engagement and reflexive interactions, which means that it is more influential to the community members compared with video websites and the content of live streaming are actually unpredictable. Even the streamers themselves would not know what they are going to encounter during the streaming process. And the post-production moderation is not enough because most streamers, most streamers, most viewers watch the streaming simultaneously, not afterward. So it caused the necessity of real-time monitoring and create an overwhelming workload for the moderators and raise the questions about who should take the responsibilities and how can outdated policies catch up with ever-changing industry. Because a few years ago, if we talk about live streaming, we mean the game live streaming. And in recent years, we can see the popularity of outdoor live streaming. And in this year, partly because of the coronavirus outbreak, e-commerce live streaming become the most popular content. So how can the policies catch up with this ever-changing situation? I compare Twitch and Douyu, well actually they are representing US and China, and I find that firstly, they got different main concerns. They all, uh, what they are concerning them are the online terror, child abuse, privacy violation, harassment and nudity. But for US, they care about transparency of the moderation and freedom of speech. And for China, uh, most, in most situations, they, they are still worrying about the political sensitive content and vulgar content in terms of promoting the cultural construction and stability. The second difference is because it's about share supermarket. Twitch has a core symbolically in the US and EU, while Douyu is just one of the largest live streaming platforms. There are others like YY, We Are and Douyu and Crypto, leading to oligopoly. And partly because of it, sorry, Chinese platforms tend to protect top streamers. Why? because those top streamers are the resources that these, these, these four platforms are competing for. So they would like to violate the rules. Uh, so they would like to tolerate it, even if those streamers violate the rules, which cause the inconsistent moderations because they want to keep these streamers in their platforms. Don't let them switch to another platform to dodge restrictions. And the difference three is that the monetization channel Twitch makes money mainly through advertising and subscriptions. 
why donation is just a prosperative, a prospective source of revenue. But the main monetization channel of Douyu is actually donation rather than ad advertisements. And because of this instant rewarding system, so the streamers can get money when someone donates money to him. So these Douyu streamers tend to entertain audiences unscrupulously for more donations, and that's caused even more troubles. What are the Douyu's measures? Firstly, Douyu is using a real-time monitoring team and real name registration. Uh, as required by the government, they got a thousand of people to take a closer look at every streaming channel every day, and they develop specific regulation code. And they use real name registration to support it. Because when the account and the identity are binding together, these streamers cannot switch to another account to dodge the punishment because the platforms and government publish or ban the person, not just their account directly. But that also caused the problem about freedom of speech. And secondly, peer surveillance for the community members. There are moderators called channel moderators. They are not the employer of the company. They are the fans of the streamer in that channel. And they are nominated by the streamers to be the moderators. They do the moderation voluntarily and sometimes rewarded by streamers, not necessarily. And this one is very effective because those moderators, those fans, care about the environment of this channel. And they are more willing to do, do something to purify the environment. And they are more familiar with the content of that channel. Because you know the content on the live streaming varies. Secondly, flaggers. So these are, the, these are the same as the other flaggers in social media platforms. But a, diff, a little difference is that though you reward those reporters, kind of encourage those flaggers to report some uh, inappropriate information. What did Twitch do? Firstly, moderation by the platforms. So in the moderation by the platforms, Twitch got the same strategy as though you, they have TOS and community guidelines, and they can suspend or ban those accounts. But Twitch did an even better job for the channel regulation by the users. Firstly, they use uh, channel moderators, just like Douyu, but with the help of automatic filter, which means that those moderators can personalize this automatic filter to do the jobs by them, to do the jobs by this AI itself, and they can focus on the sexual account, uh, sexual content, or violent content based on the feature of their specific channels. And in addition, they also offer a way to block certain groups of viewers. There are sub-only mode and follow mode, which means that only subscribers and followers can enter and join the discussion. And thirdly, there's a chat delay system, uh, which is helped by auto mode developed by Twitch. This auto mode can detect risky information by machine learning and NLP, and they hold those risky information for those channel moderators to take a closer look. So after reviewing it, they can release those risk, risk information or just uh, moderate it. But there are, so given such situation, there are existing issues, firstly, in your corporate moderations. About the case of Lubenway, one uh, a key point is that the channel regulators during the conflicts the channel regulators moderate all the content that are against the against Luban Wei. And another problem is that not only those channel moderators, the Douyi itself want to protect this streamer. So there are some other streamers in their channels broadcasting and showing how Luban Wei is cheating during the games. And Douyi censor all that channels to protect their top celebrity Luban Wei, which caused the problem of the right of speech ambiguous, outdated rules, and inconsistent consistent information, because they do that to protect the Douyi's benefit, the financial benefit, in the name of self-regulation. So that's a problem. Secondly, high workload for the moderators, and also the freedom of competition. Because some streamers move to the platforms to dodge the, to dodge the restriction, and this in, imposing the self-regulation on the platforms can also cause the problem of competition, because those Industrial giants are more advantaged. They got more budget and they're more experienced in the moderation. Why the smaller platforms cannot afford the cost of the regulations? And that is the situation in China right now. Previously, there are hundreds of platforms. And right now, 
there are only less than 100, and it's already a situation of oligopoly, partly because of many, the plat many platforms in China have been closed down because of the punishment for the government and the high cost of, of self-regulation. So I offer some suggestions. Firstly, a notice and contest system. For the transparency, consistency, and effectiveness of, of the moderations, those moderators should keep users informed and why their content has been removed or disabled access in de detail. Because that's the key point of the moderation. You cannot merely censor in those content. You have to let the users know why, what kind of content is inappropriate and violated rules, and, and why, why is that the case. And they can also offer a way to the users to contest those moderation. So there need to be a two-way communication. In addition, competent authorities should also require platforms to publish a regulation report, including the notice and context. And there should be selected cases made publicly available for the references. So in this way, people and the computer authorities can catch up with the change sort of authorities. And that's what exactly YouTube is doing right now. And also, the second suggestion is to improve the efficiency of real-time regulation. They can improve the automatic regulation technologies, and they can also use trusted community moderators and trusted flaggers based on the report of the moderation notice and contest. They can rate those flaggers and moderators and based on this data, and so all the moderators can focus on those trusted flaggers. And finally, support small platforms. I found that Australia e-safety commission uh, offer a very good suggestion that self-regulation is only voluntary for the small platforms and it's only mandatory for the big platforms. In this way, we, we can protect those small platforms. And in China, we can also offer subsidy for the self-regulation of smaller platforms. And they can ask the help from the third party moderators uh, using that subsidy. So in this way, we can support smaller platforms and protect the competition. So finally, about conclusion. So these platforms got different situations, different purposes, but they share similar issues about the timely and effective moderation, freedom of speech and competition, and also ambiguous and outdated rules. So we call for a necessity of real-time moderation and strengthen the self-regulation. Build a notice and contesting system for the transparency and consistency to improve the efficiency of real-time moderations and to support small platforms. And that's my presentation. Thank you very much. That was fantastic. That was so interesting. Um, I'm just going to unmute everybody. Did anyone have a question for Duan Bo? Um, I have a question. Um, I, it's kind of a two-part question. I'm really interested in the 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 moderator, and I, I have kind of two th two questions for you. One one is a question about um, the the motivation of the moderator. Like, why does the moderator do this work? Is it out of loyalty to the streamer? Um, you, you said sometimes the moderator is being paid out of the donations to the channel. Um, but I wonder if there's there's more to it than that. And then the other part of it is, um, what, what kind of risk does the moderator assume? Uh, so in, in these kind of controversies where the moderator has or hasn't allowed certain kinds of content, does this are there kind of risks to the moderator here in doing this kind of work? Uh, about your first question about the motivation, actually, most most moderators do that voluntarily. They didn't receive any rewards. They just enjoy this environment and partly because of the censorship, censorship for the government. If they do not purify the environment, they do not do the moderator's job, when the government do it, the channels might be banned. So they want to protect this community and they enjoy that community. So that's his major motivation for that. And they also want to create an intimate relationship with the streamers themselves. And that's the point of the motivation. And sorry, I didn't get your second question. Could you please say that again? Yeah, sorry, it's a question about risk. So, I mean, that was a great answer. It's really interesting. And um, uh, I, I like talking about that, but I, but I have this other question, which is about risk. Uh, is the moderator taking on risks here, either uh, risks of upsetting other participants in the channel, but also risks in terms of allowing or not allowing content 
uh, that say a government regulator, uh, um, uh, you know, would think they made the wrong make if there are some risks you take on by being the moderator of a channel. Actually, they are not taking any risk. The only risk is that they are, if they don't do the jobs, and the problem is that the, the channel may be censored by government. And if there are some problems, there won't, there won't be any consequences to the moderators. There will only be consequences to the streamers. And mm -hmm. you also raise a question about freedom of speech. Because these moderators are overpowered somehow, so there could be excessive uh, moderation. Actually, that's why I call for a notice and contest system to avoid such problems. It's interesting um, that in our session yesterday in the Digital Services Act, which is being developed in Europe, there is a whole article on moderation. And one of the things that people are looking for is rights of appeal and notice. Yeah, so that, that's becoming quite a key issue, I think, across platform governance. Maisie, you had a question. Yeah, I, my question was actually about, you know, um, because uh, Yuan Bo mentioned that users, um, they should be given the right to appeal, which you just mentioned. I think that was uh, something that's very interesting. I was just uh, um, wondering, um, like, have you identified similar um, functions in in other live streaming platforms because I know that you, you're basically looking at Yuan Bo, sorry, so you so you and Twitch. Um, so did you look at other streaming platforms? You know, like um, can you um, are you familiar with the moderation processes um, about other streaming platforms in live streaming? In the live streaming platforms or other social media platforms? No, 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 live streaming platforms. Only live streaming. Um, Actually, some platforms uh, like YY, they offer a way for the streamers, uh, for those stream, for those users to contest when they are facing some uh, removal of the content. But that's not very mm -hmm. effective. They have to send an email or send a message to those um. to those moderators. And another problem is that somehow I think we have to make those notice and contacts public available uh, because uh. because you cannot. Because you, you have to increase the transparency of that. You can, and you have to make it more consistent than previously. So actually, the typical case, so the companies, as I suggest, the companies should submit a report about the notice and the contest to the competent authorities. And there should be selective cases, those typical cases, be selected and make public available on those websites, on the Douyu, on live stream platforms, including the, including the contest. So mm -hmm. that, and so that is the reference for the future cases. Does that answer the question or? Yeah, definitely. Thank you. I'm sorry. James, you also had a question too, I saw. Yeah, um, I, I think we've kind of already touched on some of them, but I suppose it just comes to questions of training and, and best practice for moderators. Um, are there any sort of um, things that you found that help moderators learn about the role they're actually undertaking? and develop skills, particularly if it's like an unpaid job they're doing for fun? Actually, there are two different forms of moderators. The first one is the employer of the platforms. They are under good training, of course. And the second one, as I mentioned, is the community members, the channel moderators. I don't think they are under good training. They are just do it following the rules that, how to say, following the rules of the streamers and the channels. And those rules are developed by the by the streamers. So actually, I don't think that is very consistent. That's why we need to improve those community uh, moderation in the first place. But as I mentioned, the community mem members are more willing to purify the environment, and they are more familiar with the specific content of this channel because the content varies in different channels. That's why we have to, as you mentioned, we have to provide training. That's a good suggestion provide a good training for those room regulators, but who should take responsible of that is still an urgent question. Thank yeah. You. Yeah, no, it's a great question, James, because I mean, training of moderators, all of this sort of work has been done within communities informally, 
um, for many years. And it's only now that we're starting to look at more consistency in platform um, governance that these questions are being asked. So I think it'll be interesting to see how they vary across platforms and across countries. And certainly with the professionalization of community management, we are going to see that become more of um, a professional role, I think, rather than a voluntary one. Um, we're almost uh, ready, I think, to hear from Maisie, yeah? Are you right to yeah. go? Yeah, Thank you, sure. Swambo, for so much for that um, really, really interesting presentation. I'm looking forward to the questions that come in on that one. So when you're ready, Maisie, if you want to share your screen, that'd be great. Yeah. Here we can see. All right, there we go. Um, hi everyone, uh, so I'm Maisie. Uh, yes, I did my PhD at QUT, but currently I'm working at the uh, University of Sydney. Um, so my topic today is regulating Chinese and North American digital media in Australia. Uh, and I'm using two case studies so that's uh, taking Facebook and WeChat as an example. So I guess we, uh, we would all agree that the digital platforms uh, such as, you know, Google, Facebook, Amazon, and also um, the Chinese ones by the Alibaba and Tencent, they are becoming increasingly central to our economy. Uh, and these companies, they are disrupting the social, cultural, and uh, economic routines on global scale. Uh, sorry, on global scale. Um, and they are using the interconnected services uh, known as um, the network effects, you know, where these companies, they are creating these network effects so that their services could connect to each other. And by doing that, they will um, be able to create a, mon a monopoly and be able to reach more audiences. Um, so because of, you know, the network effects and um, this um, phenomenon of monopolization, um, we could see why the traditional regu uh, regulatory approaches need to be uh, improved so that they could better adapt to, the, uh, to these new challenges. Um, Maisie, do you reckon you could um, uh, bring your presentation full screen? Yeah. Thank you. Um, okay. All right. Fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. So as we can see in this picture, uh, numerous countries, so they are trying to work out how to regulate digital platforms. So we've got uh, the Australian Competition and Commission, Consumer uh, Commission, that's ACCC. Uh, they released a media, uh, uh, they issued a media release in which it emphasized that they will uh, investigate uh, the, um, the, first, the world first inquiry into the market power and also the general corporate behavior of digital platforms. Uh, and also around the same time, uh, there's the European Union where they issued the general data protection regulation in May 2018. And also Mark Zuckerberg appeared before the US Congress. So these digital platforms, uh, they're being regulated in different parts of the world. Now the questions to be asked is, um, you know, we've got the US based platforms, so um, the question for the US based platform, such as Google, Facebook, and Twitter, um, is how to regulate under different political systems, because we know that obviously they have to, you know, um, operate under the provisions of local laws. Uh, but then um, it, it's tricky, I think, do they actually will, will they follow um, the orders from the local government or uh, will they have the power to counter against their regulation? And also for China-based tech giants, you know, um, uh, I think there is there is a blank a blank spot uh, where we we didn't see any overseas regulation about Chinese-based tech giants. So um, this is why I'm interested to figure out how are these uh, big companies being regulated uh, in the Australian market. So of course we need to think about you know why I'm comparing uh, the regulation of Facebook and WeChat in Australian market. Uh, we need to give a rationale to justify the comparison uh, between Facebook and uh, um, and WeChat and the regulation in Australia. 
Um, so we know that the regulation for Facebook and Google uh, is nothing new. It's a regular feature uh, in Australian in Australian market and in uh, the global um, market as well. Um, this is, um, however, we need to take a look at the regulation of Chinese um, tech, tech technology platforms in Australia, because um, you know, for one thing, China and Australia they have strong economic ties between the two countries, uh, and also we need to you know be aware of the size and scale of the Chinese immigration in the Australian society. Um, and you know, it's uh, the, the the Chinese immigration community is the second largest immigration community in Australia. And also, there's uh, this rapid expansion of Chinese digital uh, platforms in Australian market. Uh, and also, in the meantime, uh, Australia is also a major international market for Chinese digital platforms. Uh, for example, Australia is the third largest international market for Alibaba, following Russia, Southeast Asia, um, and WeChat is attracting more and more uh, non-Chinese speaking users and even Australian politicians. So in this sense, um, Australian market is unique in that it is politically tied to the US, but economically bound to China. So the world's biggest um, digital platforms, uh, such as US and also China-based services, are simultaneously playing on the field. Uh, the Chinese government, however, holds supreme power over their domestic market, uh, whereas Australia aims to encourage the development of free markets. So that's a difference. Um, and as for America, they pursue the idea of a freedom of speech and the vacillation between the social contract and the democratic rights of the freedom of speech. So how is Facebook being regulated in Australia? Um, we have identified the two main problems with Facebook. So the first one is content regulation. Um, and of course, when we talk about content regulation, there's the problems of misinformation, the uh, violent materials and everything, you know, so content regulation is a broader concept. Um, and also there's the problems of uh, election campaign where uh, we've identified um, like how platforms can be um, used or um, can be manipulated uh, during the election campaign. So where uh, there are cases such as the Cambridge Analytica. So these are the two main things I think um, are um, could be used as a good comparison with the WeChat regulation in Australia. Um, so as for the um, regulation for Facebook in Australia, we've got the abhorrent of video material act and also as James mentioned you know um, the Australian government they are compelling um, the uh, Facebook to pay for um, media content but then it is a question asking whether they will follow such orders or where you know whether they will um, simply refuse refuse to do that um, and also there's this whole discussion about um, creating or establishing uh, the Facebook constitution, which means you know regulating platforms as complex as Facebook is something um, uh, very difficult to achieve, and therefore you know, you know we may need a constitution to actually be able to regulate platforms such as Facebook. So here is the regulation for WeChat. Now, regulations for which have is something that calls for our attention these days, um, because for one thing, uh, WeChat now has more than 30% registered non-English speaking, um, sorry, 30% uh, registered, um, yeah, non-English speaking users, and it has more than 1.5 million monthly Australian users. And, uh, the recent election campaign, um, not recent, last year, uh, finally put WeChat on people's radar. So experts realized that comparing to the Western platforms such as Facebook, 
which had, has not been properly monitored by the Australian government, and it may have unforeseeable impact on the election results. Um, and recently, in April 2020, uh, there is a submission uh, of WeChat regulation to the Australian uh, government, which is, you know, a bit, uh, which just to become uh, public on the internet. So uh, it would be very interesting to see if Australian government will take any sort of actions to this submission. Um, and this is currently an on, uh, ongoing research. So I wouldn't be able to come up with any detailed um, concurrence, but um, what, what I can get from looking at the regulation of WeChat in Australia is that currently there is no specific regulations outside China. Uh, so this is the case in Australia, but also in other countries, which means um, which means the regulation of WeChat, you know, um, we know that the Chinese government, they have strict censorship on WeChat. However, they are filtering uh, political sensitive content uh, across the platform. Um, and in the meantime, they have strict censorship about um, of the violent material or, um, you know, um, unhealthy content. So they are strict in a certain way. However, it's a, the, the foreign government, they are worried that the Chinese government is able to use uh, the censorship of WeChat uh, to, however, uh, to create some um, content that is not politically sensitive to China, but politically sensitive to other countries. So that's a pro problem. That's, you know, the, the content that are politically sensitive to other countries are not the ones that is going to be monitored by the Chinese government. So we call this phenomenon as the uh, porous censorship, where the Chinese government is able to create divergence and the distractions. Uh, that's why um, the, foreign, the, the, the foreign government has a fear of this infiltration for, uh, from the Chinese government because of this phenomenon. So the fundamental debate would be, you know, to think about the regulation uh, on WeChat and on Facebook. Um, are we treating these digital platforms as publishers or distributors? So this is a big question. Uh, if we were to treat these platforms as publishers, that that means that uh, you know they need to have um, a certain kind of um, censorship uh, the, on their content. They need to be responsible for their content, which would probably to some extent, limit uh, the user's right to freedom of speech. Um, however, there's the other end of the spectrum. You know, if we treat the platform simply as distributors, um, then then how do we decide which kind of content they should be responsible for? So, I think it's an imperative to establish um, a, a very effective regulatory framework. Um, and what's um, important is that uh, the technology companies, they should not be uh, the only ones uh, to decide what to regulate um, from a public policy perspective. So that's my sort of my concurrence here. And thank you. Thank you so much, Maisie. Um, questions, people. Do does anyone have a question for Maisie? I'm just trying to unmute you now. There we go. Yeah, one book. Okay, so about this cross border uh, regulation, mm -hmm. actually, many people are asking me that kind of question. So as I was Australian, no. So th those people, as an Australian, are encountering some issues like Chinese live streamers making videos based on those materials that include including the strangers like random Australians and shops and even the staffs and they are making those videos and profiting for those videos which cause the problem of the infringement of privacy but that's not a major concern in China right now but that's the major concern in Australia but if those videos are broadcasting 
in China, not just in Aust not not in Australia. How can we regulate such content? I mean, in terms of the cross border regulation. Yeah, I, I, yeah, that's that's why I think this is um very tricky issue and that's why i mentioned some ongoing research you know i i want to figure out how um content are regulated in different countries and under different political systems uh so for the platforms for example for example wechat um when they are operating overseas um they have a different server which means that, you know, they're probably implementing a different uh, uh, censorship, a different kinds of censorship. Um, and as for the global, you know, the, the platforms that are operating globally, where their content can be shared and distributed across borders, um, I guess for, for, for that kind of content, we need to, you know, be specific. Um, in terms of the regulations, as in, uh, you know, the government, they should have some kind of regulations or some kind of policies say, this is the kind of content that can be distributed uh, in Australia um, or not overseas. You know, I think we require some specific regulations for, um, for those content. James, you had a question. Yeah, thank you, Meza. That was fantastic. Um, I just had a question about these companies um, themselves. And, you know, thinking about the, um, the US comparisons, Google and Facebook, it took them some time to set up shop here in Australia, for example. And I think even longer to, to seriously start thinking about policy engagement. Um, are these companies recognising that they're obviously becoming transnational and starting to prepare policy strategy accordingly, setting up local offices, um, et cetera? That's a very good question. Um, I think, you know, if, if the Australian government, you know, I mentioned a submission to, of which had regulation mm. to the Australian government. So if the government is going to take any kinds of regulations on WeChat. Um, they might have start. They might consider to start, um, you know, establishing the um, local um, offices to deal with these issues. But I, I guess I need to um, look for informa information as for you know for com for companies like Google and Facebook. Um, I guess I guess because they are global powers, they're they're really powerful. I, I don't think you know um, sometimes they have the power to counter against the local government or the US government. So um, I guess it's a matter of question like how do they recognize themselves and how do they um, um, it's a question of how if they will position themselves as responsible as you know at, 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 in a certain level as publishers and not simply as distributors as distributors i think that's the um, ultimate question there mm. so yes i think for, to regulate those big companies you know we, we can't simply just say you know, uh, we, we, we have this regulation policy and th th this is something you have to obey, this is the law. Um, I think they have the power to you know, go beyond that because I come across one example that is, uh, I think one of the European countries, I, I couldn't remember which one, um, the, 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 one of the European countries, their local government is, uh, is uh, saying to Google that you need to pay for the content in our country. And as a result, Google just support its service entirely Spain. from that country. Yeah, yeah Spain, right? Yeah. So, yeah. So as you can see, they have the power. You know, if if you if if my value doesn't coincide with your local laws, I could I could simply you know just choose not to operate in your country at all. 
which is more of a threat, I suppose, from the larger platforms than it would mm -hmm. be from a platform that's trying to enter external mm -hmm. markets. For example, WeChat. If, yeah. if, for example, WeChat wants to break into international markets and, um, say, the Australian government decides to try and regulate political uh, comment or political mm -hmm. advertising on WeChat, um, will WeChat pull out of Australia? Definitely not. No. no. Yes, it'll be. I think these these debates are fascinating for that. Um, uh, from that perspective of looking at what happens to the smaller platforms, I think mm -hmm. that was something that that uh, a couple of people have mentioned, particularly you, um, Wampo, looking at, at how do we manage competition issues and how do we manage trust issues with smaller platforms. Mm -hmm. mm. Um, did anyone else have a question for Maisie? Because we are getting very short of time. I think we've got room for one more. I'll come in and ask a question if that's okay. Um, yeah, go for it, Nick. I'm, I'm kind of interested here. Yeah, I built a little bit off James's comment that, you know, like Facebook and Google were, I mean, were, you know, it took them some time to establish local representation in Australia. And it really coincided with um, not just the rise of certain political issues around the regulation of the platforms, but really around this becoming a valuable ad market. Uh, for them and i just wondered whether that is also in play Maisie. so to what extent is is wechat's push into international markets um political like a form of you know um public diplomacy in a sense and to what extent is it uh do, would you say that wechat or other chinese platforms are trying to build advertising markets internationally okay so there so actually you you mentioned two things in your question, right? So the first one is the advertising strategy of WeChat in the international market, particularly in Australia. Um, and in the other one is their um, political policies, right? So as for the advertising strategy, um, WeChat is um, collaborating with almost um, all the big Australian uh, big companies, um, big commercial companies in China, you know, such as uh, Maya, David Jones. So it's 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 very common to see um, these advertising popped up in WeChat, you know, from um, the big uh, Australian companies. So from this is a, a, a you know an evidence that uh, WeChat is collaborating with those big companies already. Um, and as for the political engagement, um, I think we like based from based on the electoral campaign, election campaign of uh, in Australia last year, uh, we can see that um, there is um, there are a lot of um, election campaign related news that are being circulated on WeChat. Uh, and there is um, this concern that um, the Chinese immigration community in Australia will be somehow misled by those information. So the, the debate of, about political engagement of WeChat is definitely there. But then um, I guess I still need to, you know, to do to investigate more so that I can get a clear idea. I think. Um, to what extent um, are we talking about uh, in terms of the political engagement? Are they uh, actually you know, creating um, real influences or not? Uh, and also comparing to Facebook, um, what are the differences in terms of the influence of their uh, election campaigns? And that's what I need to do in the future. Well, we're going to look forward to that research, Maisie. Thank you. Thank you all so much for today. We've gone, oh, look, we've traversed extraordinary territory. We've gone from, you know, sort of the emerging marketing strategies on platforms right through, you know, kind of the boundaries of dependency of news organisations on platforms, um, issues around content moderation and live streaming, and now cross-border regulatory issues. 
So it's all fantastically interesting research. We're really looking forward to the papers. Thank you, James, for giving references to yours. That's good. And, you know, if anyone has anything that they want to post um, in the, on the platform alongside the video, let me know. Um, because I think we'll be able to post comments um, alongside the videos. So if you have, for example, links to your work or um, to reports that you want to uh, highlight, let me know. Otherwise, thank you. Thank you all for taking part in this. You know, it's a, <laughs> it's a great Thanks, experiment Anna. and I'm really looking forward to the feedback. So on behalf of myself and, um, and the QUT crew, Thank you for taking part and good luck with your research. Thanks, Fiona. Thank Thanks you. for having me. Thanks. All right. See ya. Uh, let me just stop the.